Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome to the R Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm Rachel Dempsey. I'm sure I've met many of you before at, at meetups like this. Thank you for joining again. But for today's meetup, we will learn how the team at KPMG is scaling their data science applications across the enterprise and working with front end development teams using microservices in our Studio Connect. Um, so Tom will be kicking things off first. Tom is a researcher and author on applying technology, data, and analytics to make better decisions. He's currently a managing director at KPMG and previously served as the chief data officer for the city of Chicago. Tom will get us going here and then turn it over to Bijan. Bijan uh, Sadagian is a director of analytics at KPMG and leads data science development which spans from advanced analytics to machine learning engineering. And so excited to turn it over to you, both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for, for having us here. Uh, it is exciting to talk about R in production. Uh, I'm a longtime R user and developer. It goes back to my time in grad school when Hadley Wickham and I were both at Iowa State in grad school. Uh, I was using early versions of Reshape and ggplots, uh, well before ggplot2. And so it goes all the way back to then where it was a statistical language and now seeing the, the language mature to talk about being used in production. And gonna talk about how we use uh, R in production at KPMG. So I just wanna be clear, KPMG is a consulting firm, but this isn't about what we've done for clients or a use case that we're advocating for. This is how we are using R within our environment and particularly about using microservices and able to scale out data science across the enterprise. And the reasons why we opted to go down the microservices route. And there's been meetups here and there's been conversations elsewhere talking about using Shiny and how to scale Shiny across the enterprise and the tactics and techniques to do that which is absolutely a potential way of doing it. We've taken a different path by trying to use microservices to be part of the data science team. And we're gonna talk about why we went down that path, the benefits that has provided us, some of the challenges that you should anticipate to see when using microservices, and absolutely giving you at least a couple of demos today to show how this actually works in production. So I'll hop back, I'll hop right into it, and then uh, Bijan will take over for a good chunk of the conversation and, and hopefully have a good, uh, good opportunity for Q&A at the end of this presentation. So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about a few things, six things in particular. What are the challenges of growing a data science team? I've, I've built a number of data science teams at this point in the commercial sector as I do today. I've worked in the public sector when I served as chief data officer for the city of Chicago. So talk about the challenges and trade-offs of what it, it looks like to grow a data science team and why microservices start to enter the equation. Second, talk about microservices. Uh, what are they exactly? Uh, there's a lot written on the topic of microservices. I got a couple of my favorite uh, textbooks here that I have read around the concept of microservices. And then we're gonna dive into a demo, a hello world, very simple example of a microservices. Then talk about how to plan and design for microservices and, and take a look at a demo, uh, an application demo. And then finally, uh, time for Q&A and, and, a, and a recap. So the challenges of and the trade-offs of growing uh, a data science team, or what I call is like how I stopped worrying about hiring, because this is something as the team is growing, you start getting to these concerns about how do you scale the applications and how do you scale your team to work across uh, one or many different applications. So as a getting good presentation, we're going to summarize this as a graph. And so there's always this trade-off that we have in our work as data scientists or software developers between complexity and what I just call being hackish in terms of trying to implement something. And we probably have all felt it. We're working on trying to do something that's more complex, but we're trying to do it without hacking around, being too clever on trying to implement a solution, trying to back in engineering something to make it work because that creates long-term liability. Uh, you might be the only person that knows how to deal with a particular uh, solution that you've built. So in that uh, uh, left upper left-hand quadrant there, you see that sort of programmer's lore where you do a lot of complexity, but you don't 
do do it in a very hackish way in the lower right hand corner that Rube Goldberg zone of you know, doing something that's not very complex but doing it in an absolute hackish way. And that 45 degree line is really that balance and trying to recognize okay how do we do more complex things again without being too hackish on the solution. And this is something that Bijan and I and our team think about quite a bit. How do we do our work well is essentially what this summarizes too. So we're going to talk about how microservices helps you do things, things with greater complexity or complex needs, but without going into too much of a, a hackish zone. So this is something that we often see within growing our analytics tool set. So uh, as you see in those big bubbles, we talk about the progression of user needs over time. So when you build a data science application or some sort of solution, you know, immediately you make folks happy, you make your data scientists happy, you make your developers happy because you say, hey, somebody needed something, I got a version one out there, everybody's, everybody's fantastic and everybody's happy. And then the user needs increase. And sometimes that's just, okay, need a few more graphs. Okay, there's more complexity, more interactivity that's needed. Uh, there's other things that need to be polished, nicer looking buttons. Uh, then there's things that start to kind of grate at you like, well, I really like these graphs. Can you have them so they can be exported into PowerPoint? I'm like, okay, we can, don't wanna do that, but sure, if that's what you needed. And then after you get all that done, a, a user might come back to you. He's like, actually, no, my priorities were different. I need something completely different. And that's, this is that progression where you're trying to balance with your data scientists on their happiness and your developer team's happiness. So they can be engaged, they can continue, continue to get that satisfaction working in projects and try to avoid some of that grading aspects on progressing and changing your, your applications and solutions over a period of time. And when you do this in Shiny, there's a number of different issues that pop up, one of which really is it becomes more and more difficult to have multiple developers on working on the same piece of code. Uh, because of the way the Shiny applications and the application structure tends to work, you tend to work on one or two individual files. Now there's workarounds to this, certainly. You can source other files, you can do other tricks, but it gets complicated over a period of time. So you might having two coders who are trying to work on the same segments of code, somebody who's working on a very large segment of code, other people might be work, waiting on that other segment of code to be done. Um, and there's oftentimes this conflicts that start to arise. And we're gonna talk about a project uh, today that was getting to 15,000 lines of code in Shiny. And it was creating a large number of conflicts as the development team was trying to work on new features. So, it has led us to microservices. If we take a look at those different challenges and, and those balancing needs, we want to start talking about microservices. So we're going to describe this at a high level, and then we're going to dive into it quite a bit. And I will say there will be a forthcoming blog post that dives into the technical details a lot more, but, so we're going to address this at a cursory level for a period of time. So, in short, this is a, a very in short version of it. Microservices really help separate out the different layers of an application. So there can be a web or user interface uh, that allows somebody to navigate information, but that's separate from the underlying logic of the application, where in the case of Shiny, those things get uh, mashed together into a, a same or what we call monolithic code structure, because it separates it out because underneath that interface, you have a series of APIs or web services, uh, RESTful APIs, things like that, that allow you to build APIs that control that interactivity. So when somebody's clicking on a on a, something in a web browser, it's communicating via APIs behind it. And behind those APIs is a data storage or database technology that allows you to, uh, to, to query and, and bring in data. And that separation between the user interface and the APIs and web services helps simplify your code structure and also allows different people to work on the same bits of code. And the reason why we're talking about this here today is because that web interface and those APIs and web services can be completely hosted on RStudio Connect. RStudio Connect basically is a, a web server and you can host 
web files on there. If you upload index.html, it will, it will render that in, in addition to shining everything else. So it allows us to host things such as a React or Angular or other web technology within the RStudio Connect environment. And for us, we use the React technology. And again, that's uh, hosted on top of APIs and web services, which could be done in either Plumber, which we have done in our team, or using Flask in the Python language. So what does a simple example of a microservices look like? Uh, let's, say, let's say we have a bunch of time series data and we want to do a forecast of that time series data. And you're actually gonna see a demo of this here in a moment, uh, but to explain the architecture, uh, you have data that's holding on to historical time series information. So all those entries about historical, uh, historical entries for the time series. Then you have an our model, let's say it's an ARIMA model that can do the time, uh, that can do the forecasting uh, that is written by data scientists. And then on top of that, you deploy APIs and web services that communicate back to that analytical model that in turn ter uh, communicate back to that database that will actually do the forecast. And then that forecasted data is then presented up to the web, uh, to the website or the dashboard that allows the, the user to see that in a visual format. And so the reason why we separate that apart is because then the front end, that, that user interface, can be developed by an independent web developer or a full stack developer. And you can have web designers working on that. So you don't need to hire that shiny developer anymore and focus on that very particular skill set, but be able to bring in uh, uh, web development technologies that are more broadly used in, in other environments as well. Meanwhile, the web services can be programmed by your data scientist because it can be done in R, the Python language, in addition to the data engineer or backend developer or other full stack developers to be able to build out those web services. And then again, this is in contrast to a shiny application architecture where really that front end and all that logic a lot of times is buried in the shiny piece of the application. And so that restricts the number of individuals who really can do work on that piece. And the takeaway of why this is so beneficial, it really allows that front end uh, development technology to flourish because you can tap into the entire ecosystem of development technologies uh, that, that can be brought to bear with your web developers. So I talked about a time series example, and so it'd be great to then share an example, actually take a look at a code base of what does that look like? What does Microsoft services look like uh, within an application using a very simple hello world example. And for that, Bijan is okay if I turn it over to you. Absolutely, yeah, I will uh, take it on from here. Like Tom mentioned, uh, this is a, a very simple demonstration of a, a, a microservice that would do some prediction. Um, I'll get into a little bit of the details of the backend um, in a second, um, but this, took not more than a day uh, to put together. Um, the front end is in a React application uh, and the back end is hosted on RStudio Connect um, using Plumber. This demonstration is pretty simple. Uh, a user would come in, they would say, I want to see um, a forecast of some time series data uh, over the next 48 periods. Um, we'd hit submit. What's happening now is the client side uh, is making a request to RStudio uh, Connect to our API. Uh, it's making that prediction with our pre-trained model, and then it's responding with all of that information. Um, the benefit of having those two separate, uh, as opposed to having Shiny kind of handle it all at once, is that Shiny has to render the front end and, the, and do the computation on the back end. That's fine for one person, um, but when you try to scale things, that puts a lot of load on the server. Um, having this separation lets the client side do some light calculations and rendering, uh, and then the heavier calculations on the back end. Um, again, very simple demonstration of uh, what microservices can do. One thing that I want to um, also kind of call out here is that uh, one of the benefits of having them separate like this is that you can actually touch the back end without the front end. Uh, so, Just a quick question, Bijan, if you could zoom in a little bit of course. when you flip over to the other one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this one is in the way. Awesome. Know. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I can zoom in on this one though. Uh, I'll, I'll just speak to it briefly. So um, I'll get into a little bit more on the testing, which is what uh, is using Postman, which is what I'm showing here. But one benefit of uh, a microservice uh, backend is that you can touch those backend points without having to go through a web interface. Um, so one thing that I just did is I made a prediction, um, but that prediction uh, service is actually calling another service uh, that does our logging. 
Um, so I can also make a request and see, okay, well, I just made a request uh, you know, two minutes ago um, for a prediction. Um, just being able to touch the back end and from different systems uh, is a huge benefit for uh, microservices because you don't have everything encapsulated into one code base. So what I'm showing here is the architecture of that um, relatively basic uh, uh, microservice uh, app. Um, so we saw the web interface, which is a React-based um, uh, uh, application. Uh, and I made a request to one, micro, one, one service um, that does our forecast. Um, that service also made a request to a separate service that handles all of our logging. Um, this may not, it may not make sense to, you know, why do you have these two separate? Uh, until you start thinking about when you start building other products, you probably don't want to use the same logging surface. Uh, so you get that benefit of not having to build it in every single app uh, and instead call to this, the one instance that you have uh, from every single one of your apps. Um, one example I can give you is uh, about a year ago, we, we had a fundamental change to uh, our logging code where we were using um, a package at the time. Um, Every single one of our shiny apps, um, which was roughly about 20 of them, um, had that code installed when they when they were published uh, to our Studio Connect. Um, when we had to make that change, we actually had to have all of our developers pause their work, um, spend about two weeks um, making that change in their code, testing out their code, and then republishing their applications. Every single one of them. Had we had a micro a, a logging service, um, it would have been as simple as changing the one service, doing the testing as well, but it would be a substantially less work. Um, so that's the reason for um, the separation and a, a good reason why you'd want to, um, to separate those duties instead of having it all in one code base. Um, and then the database um, is very similar to, to Shiny. You would have uh, some sort of storage so that you don't have your, uh, your app save data or put it on a file system, something like that. Okay. Um, so now I'll get into a bit of um, the lessons learned that we came across while uh, transitioning over to a microservice architecture. Um, about a year, year and a half ago, we started the first application um, on this, this type of architecture. So we were moving from a monolithic um, shiny application. Um, as Tom mentioned before, it was the application that grew to about 15,000 lines of code. Um, there were some challenges with the monolithic app, uh, architecture that uh, that more or less pushed us into making a decision of do we do we make the switch now? Um, so a year and a half ago, we started that switch, uh, and the intent of this part of the presentation is to talk through um, some challenges that we ran into and how uh, we overcame them. So uh, there are four uh, pretty overarching uh, challenges with uh, getting started with microservices, and the first one is getting started with microservices can be very daunting. Um, there's a lot of material out there. Um, microservices uh, are, are defined very similarly, but slightly different depending on which source you look at. Um, and on top of that, planning for your application um, is really a very open-ended problem because you're thinking of a service that could potentially be reused in a future use case that you have no idea about. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to plan for that service that's general enough to where it could be applied in the future and you wouldn't have to change the interface um, at that point in time, um, but not too general to where you're trying to build for the world. Um, on top of that, because these services can be used from, uh, with different, different uh, user interfaces, um, it becomes a lot more important to uh, define what that interface is um, because if you if you do have to change it in the future, you have to go back and you have to test all of the older versions or handle version control very carefully. Um, so you know, getting started is, is quite a challenge and, and we'll talk to that a bit here. Um, separation of developer duties um, comes with a, a lot of benefits because you can hire for specialized skill sets, but at the same time, coordination amongst your team uh, is even more important uh, in that case. Um, the application that we built um, over the last year and a half uh, was actually a, a worldwide team from literally all parts of the world. We had maybe a two hour window um, of everybody being online at the same time. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit of how we, we overcame that challenge um, in a second as well. Um, the third thing here is that microservices are great for uh, uh, scaling things out. Um, 
but they do come with their own set of risks that monolithic uh, apps don't necessarily have. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, and then finally, the whole microservice architecture, it generally as a, as a data scientist, there was a big knowledge gap there. Um, the way to, to kind of address that is to attend meetups like this and um, later take a look at our blog posts, but do your own research as well. Um, data scientists traditionally may or may not know a lot about uh, design patterns or HTTP requests. So um, there's generally some knowledge gaps. On top of that, smaller teams and smaller projects may um, may not get as much of a benefit out of switching to a microservice architecture versus a monolithic um, app, um, just purely based on the fact that microservices may take a bit more uh, upfront cost. Uh, and if you're not planning on reusing those services or have no intent to ever reuse those services, it may be cost that you don't necessarily want to take on. Um, so that's a, a fourth challenge. The cost benefit of it is, is something to always consider. Um, so how do you address getting started? Um, so one thing that we um, started with is uh, using domain-driven design. Uh, if you search microservices, this is very commonly what pops up first. Um, Domain-driven design is using the business uh, domain, so knowledge about the business, to conceptualize what you actually need to be building. Um, and then you take that and you build those um, as, as entities in your system. Um, so I've listed some steps here. Um, the first thing is that you want to identify your, your entities in your business domain. Um, in this graphic at the bottom left here, um, I've just put up a simple kind of e-commerce sort of thing. So you have customers who are their own entity, you have products that are their own entity, uh, and you have orders that are also an entity. Um, those are three entities in a very simple system or a very simple business. Um, the second step would be understand how those entities relate to each other. So customers will search for products, they'll make orders, orders will have products. Um, relatively simple relationship, but the point of these two parts is to then get to this, this third part of what services do you need to do? What, what actions do you need to take on these entities? Um, so on the right hand side here, um, for each one of the, the entities that I have, I have um, these are uh, HTTP um, API uh, verbs. Um, so you, you get a sense of, okay, for a customer, I need to be able to get the list of customers. I need to be able to create customers. I need to be able to edit customers. I may be, need to remove customers. Um, and so that defines the, the endpoints that you individually would need to um, create. And those endpoints create that service for customers. Um, similarly, on products, you may not need to be able to edit, which is the put request or delete. Um, and so you may have a little bit less work for products, um, but again, you create that service for products. Um, and then similarly for orders. Um, the key point for this slide is that uh, following these three steps gets you uh, from this kind of wide open field to these are what I need to be focusing on. There may be things around them, but these are the things that you need to be focusing on. Now going into the second part of planning, um, which is applying uh, design patterns and specifically cloud design patterns. So I mentioned that these entities and these relationships define um, the kind of areas that you need to focus on, but there are things around them that may pop up as well. That's what design patterns help you identify. So um, there's plenty of material out there as well on design patterns, um, but three that we've used um, are known as sidecar patterns, um, anti-corruption layers, and uh, backends for front ends. Um, what these do is they categorize your services that may not necessarily apply to products, for example, um, but may serve your a, a very particular front end that needs to know what you know the list of products or have products formatted in a very certain way. You can write a service that that services that front end specifically. A lot of, very commonly, we have websites that are designed for web and mobile, um, and they unfortunately have some differences. Um, being able to write a service that supports each one or handles one versus the other um, helps you kind of abstract that out of, out of having one service handle too many things. Um, similarly, sidecars are, are things like the logging service that I pointed to earlier. They're things that your application or your, your client will never touch, um, but they're things that your backend architecture will touch or, or things that are used behind the scenes that are never, never seen by the user. Um, the third one here is anti-corruption layers. I bring this up because uh, while we were switching over from um, a monolithic app to uh, a microservices app, 
um, there was a transition. We had to take, um, we had a legacy system that we had to interface with uh, our newer, uh, newer application. Anti-corruption layers are designed for that. This, uh, the intent here is that you serve um, from the legacy system to your new, app, your new application, but you don't have to include that kind of information inside of your app services. Um, the idea, microservices, starting with micro, is that you have them very specialized, um, doing one thing very well, um, but have logical separation to where um, one service is not stepping over another service. Um, um, the next part here is uh, separation of development duties. So um, I'll just go into uh, a bit of what we did. So we defined um, a very uh, structured documentation um, format for uh, every one of our endpoints um, or every one of our services. Uh, and we also um, utilize Swagger pretty heavily. So um, a lot of this will be coming, uh, these details will be coming in the blog in the future, um, but to go at a high level, um, every single endpoint that we built um, that comprises a service uh, started with documentation, this exact documentation on the right here. Um, and the intent was to have front end, back end, every developer on the team be on the same page and know exactly what is going to be the interface. Um, like I mentioned before, if you change the interface, everybody else has to change the work that they're doing if, if they're touching that. Um, and so establishing that up front was crucial for us to, to be effective. Um, we found that uh, this kind of format helps in a lot of ways because we define what's required, um, both in a request and a response or what comes back in your response, as well as types. Um, and an example generally helps uh, go a long way. On top of that, um, one of the great things about Plumber is that it builds your Swagger documentation automatically. Um, and so while you're uh, building your microservice, uh, you can kind of validate what you're building or anybody can validate on the team what you're building uh, against the documentation. Um, they just simply have to go to the, the URL on our Studio Connect and click on the right um, endpoint. Okay, so the third part here is talking about how to manage the, the, the newer risk that comes with microservices. Um, so one of the big risks of microservices is that they can be distributed. A monolithic uh, architecture is generally one virtual machine or one machine that's running everything. So um, the, you know, all of the calculations for the back end and for the front end are all from the single node. Um, a microservice could be on a, a, Lambda a, a Lambda function, it could be on another virtual machine, it could even be external to your company, it could be um, using a third party and, uh, API that serves uh, for a certain reason. All of those come with risk because every degree of freedom you give to your system will introduce a, a potential you know, failure point. And so being able to do functional testing and regression testing um, easily is crucial. Um, and the you know, microservices and APIs being a very fundamental thing to the web, um, there's a lot of uh, supporting doc, uh, documentation and software that will help you do this. Um, I showed uh, Postman earlier today. Um, Postman is what we used for every single one of our endpoints. Every endpoint that we developed, um, we during our pull, requ pull requests, reviewed the tests as well, made sure we uh, had you know, adequate testing, adequate coverage, um, and made sure that it was working when it was supposed to work and then caused you know, in, uh, forced failures when they, we were supposed to force them. Um, Postman is also great for um, performing schema tests as well. Um, that's something that's uh, in a loosely typed language like R or Python um, is not, uh, not very common to, to to check um, your variable type, or if you do, it, it kind of clutters up the code. Postman will actually can do uh, schema tests as well. Um, so you can expect a number when, or you can test if there's a number when you expect it. And finally, the last point here, um, I don't have a slide on, but the point um, being is that there's a lot of research out there. Even you attending this meetup today is a step in this direction, filling in these knowledge gaps and um, considering the costs and benefits. Um, so I just want to call that out is that's, that's something that if there's some overhead with microservices, there's not a lot, and there is uh, multiplicative benefits in the future if, if you start reusing these services. 
Um, but for each team, it depends on the size of the team, um, the amount of re uh, repeatable work that you do, um, as well as the, the knowledge gaps that you want to overcome. So now I'll switch over to uh, a demonstration of the application that we built um, using microservices. This application is called Coda. Um, it's the KPMG Organization Design Analyzer uh, app. Oops, did I choose the wrong one? Um, so uh, Coda is a tool for um, users to be able to um, analyze a, a company census, so the, the entire organization um, structure. Um, there are a couple of views of the organization that we provide and some statistics as well. Um, the intent is that you can do a quick analysis if you need to. Um, you can um, reorganize the, the organization if you see you know, people that are in finance reporting to people in sales that may not be so efficient for your organization. Um, the intent of Coda is to be able to assess, organize, uh, re redesign, um, do some quick analysis um, or comparisons of your design, uh, and then finally be able to ship to your, your customer. Um, so what I'm showing here is actually the reason that we switched into um, a React-based front-end. This is our, our, uh, what we call a radio plot. Um, and this is an organization where, the, in this case, the CEO is in the center of the, the org. Um, and then you know, their direct reportees are uh, the next layer out, and then the reportees outside of that. Um, doing this in Shiny um, became quite cumbersome. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit, um, because you're working with two languages that are kind of speaking interchangeably within this, the one language. Um, but Coda um, allows you to do things like, for example, um, if I wanted to select this person and reassign them here, um, I could reassign you know, their entire organization, um, everybody underneath them uh, here as well. Um, I can just do some simple things like reorder these dots around. Um, oops. Uh, Um, and I can do things like, uh, well, I won't run them here, but we can create cuts of the same visual um, and uh, produce any number of, of charts because generally our clients do ask for, um, for PowerPoints. Um, again, this is a, an analysis tool. So um, the intent here is to see, uh, I'm coloring by uh, department uh, and you get to see, so R&D, you know, well, I can actually click on it. So R&D is colored over here. We see that this person is tends to seems to be the lead of R&D, but there are also um, some people um, over here that maybe they, they shouldn't be uh, managing, or maybe we need to separate that into another person um, because uh, it's such a wide span of, of people. Um, I won't go into the details of every one of the features. Um, there's some comparison um, uh, abilities as well. Uh, and then also just a, a relatively simple dashboard that shows um, you know, your organization at different levels broken up by the departments that are um, at each level. Um, I didn't upload any compensation data, so it's not here. Um, now, if I go over to the implementation side, so this is where um, users start to make changes to the organization itself. Um, and so, uh, Again, same organization, same CEO. If I wanted to, um, let's say I want to search for um, a certain person, let's, uh, let's do Ferguson Page. Um, I would find uh, her, which would be over here. Am I not sending to the right person? Oh, here. Um, if I wanted to reassign them, I could move them to uh, this person here. Uh, and so now I've, I've kind of modified the organization. Um, also can you know add in new people to the org um, by clicking here and just new and person. Um, and one of the features that I personally love is the fact that you can actually track all the history that you're doing here and you know roll it back if I made a mistake here I can um, remove that. The Coda application um, started as a shiny app. Um, we we're embedding D3 visuals, especially the uh, radial chart uh, inside of the application. We actually had an instance of this as well that I think was really JavaScript, not necessarily D3. Um, but those two things, um, we started getting into the habit of writing um, JavaScript messages from the back end to the front end to, um, to, lift, to, to uh, trigger a callback 
to see, you know, if a user clicked on this node, if a user clicked on a node here, um, what was the note, like, what was the um, piece of information that they were looking for? Um, so we were uh, data scientists writing in R, writing in JavaScript to get this all to work. And so that's why we uh, transitioned over to have React developers write this in, in JavaScript and D3, um, but communicate to them using the language that we know, which is R. Um, that was the, the genesis of, of Coda and why we made this big switch. Um, on top of that, uh, the styling and everything was, was much easier to do um, in, a, in, in a framework like that. The four screens that I'm showing here, uh, I, I touched on the assassin design, um, so the, the radial chart and the design of, of an organization. Um, I, I didn't uh, go into the compare or the present just um, for, for time's sake, but um, the, the idea here or the intent to show this is that um, any of the visuals that we have, we have we have people with the, the right skill sets doing this um, and the people like the data scientists working within their um, their own um, professional uh, areas as well. Uh, it makes for that, that kind of separation of duties makes for a lot faster development because you don't have a data scientist learning how to write JavaScript. Um, and then uh, just a, a very basic uh, kind of application level diagram of the application I just showed, Coda. Um, so very similar to the simple demo that I shared earlier, um, we have a, a React web app, but we also um, have a Power BI dashboard that interacts with our microservice. So I mentioned earlier that microservices could be reused. Um, this is a perfect example of that. Um, Power BI is interacting with the same microservice that our React, is, that React app is. Um, and so now we have two interfaces and one um, that we uh, that is quick to we now have the opportunity to say okay well we want to build this in react because we need high interactivity um, we want to build this in power bi because maybe we want to ship that out to the client as a dashboard um, and so now we, we give us the freedom to use the best tool for the the, the right problem or for the problem um, i mentioned sidecars earlier um, Similarly, in our application, we use that for logging, some user authentication, and for monitoring. Um, and on top of that, one um, additional uh, kind of major benefit is, is being able to test um, the endpoints either in the production server or in a, in a staging server. Um, and we do that. We do that regularly. So every single release that we do, we test the entire app, uh, the entire set of services, um, and we do them um, periodically as well. Um, Netflix actually uh, has a, an idea of a, a, a chaos monkey, which is a testing node, but a testing node designed to try to find weaknesses in your system. Um, that's something on our horizon as well. Um, the benefit of using uh, microservices is that you can hit what your user would also hit, um, or, or a, a copy of that, maybe not, maybe not use the production version. Um, and I'll step over this um, just very quickly, but this is our, uh, just to connect it back to um, the uh, design, uh, domain-driven design. Um, so these are the entities and the relationships that we have for our, our Coda application. Um, I won't get into the details of that, but this is what we started with and uh, gradually built to, to where we are today. So uh, switching into now a recap. Um, Tom, would you like to, to take this one? Or yeah. So going back to what we showed earlier, what is that trade-off between complexity on users needing interactive graphs, uh, uh, which, which we're trying to do in D3, and that was creating a lot of complications, just debugging that, to being able to export things into images, into PowerPoint, where these uh, new things were coming along, and it was creating some discord within a data science team because they were needing to learn more, and that just that's very taxing, that's very tiring. So this allows us to... Uh, have folk, people focus on front-end technologies versus the data science piece of it versus the back-end piece of it. So this is our path where we first deployed in Coda and other applications that, that we have, Coda is the example that we use here, that monolithic shiny application. So it allows us to do a lot more complexity with not trying to hack around that. But then we got into JavaScript messaging and then we got into trying to get D3 to work within shiny and then it felt like we were doing too much hacking around. And over time, we knew that that was gonna be a risk to the maintaining of the applications themselves. So by switching over to that microservices uh, backend and React frontend, 
It allowed us to uh, increase the complexity of what the application was ask, asking for, but get us out of that danger zone of trying to hack things together to be able to make it work. If we can go to the next slide, Bijan, and keep it, you controlling it. So we talked about some of the benefits. So those benefits is we allowed to, that division of labor and specialization, bringing people to focus on what they do well. Uh, to be able to program in more advanced user interface. What you saw here running today was all running off of RStudio Connect, right? So I think, uh, I think uh, subjectively, qualitatively, is a very different looking thing than what people typically expect to see running within an R-based, largely an R-based application. It has multiple consumption points. Developers can hit those APIs, Power BI, BI applications can hit those APIs, uh, custom front end applications can, other programs can hit those APIs. So people can consume those, they're reusable. Uh, and you're relying on a wider universe of tools and libraries. The R ecosystem is amazing. Uh, there's hexagons everywhere that allow you to show interconnectivity, but all those are really trying to wrap in some other technology. This allows us to directly reach out to those other technologies. So again, avoids that sort of hackish, uh, hackish region. And as Bijan mentioned, if there's a cost benefit there, you just need to see, does this make sense or can I rely on the, the, the shiny, the R ecosystem exclusively and also the Python ecosystem. Uh, it's, it becomes more code agnostic and really allows you to adopt formal DevOps procedures, continuous integration, continuous deployment, code versioning, Git, all of this is underlying everything that we've talked about today because we need you need to be able to do that very well. And there, I know there's a lot of other presentations about how to use version control and all that. And those are fantastic things to dive into. But Bijan and, and the team, we've, we've mentioned a number of challenges. It does require more planning. There's a cost benefit is for every project, do we do pure shiny? Do we do this microservices approach? Requires the paramount a strong team coordination. So because it's not all in one thing, it's in different pieces. You just need to be coordinated on those different pieces. I describe it as building a bridge starting from both sides of a riverbank. You start on both sides and you need to be able to meet in the middle. And if you don't, that bridge is going to meet in the middle. And that's always what this boils down to. And so there's a unique risk within those distributed services. And additional skills and resources may be required, but if you're a growing team, this is kind of the point of it. If you're a growing team, you can make hires and front end development and other specializations to allow them to really flourish and focus on that. And again, you're, you're, you're looking at industry standard technologies. I know we got one more slide, but I think we can really wrap it up where I think we're two and a half minutes over for what we're going for. But uh, thank you for having us here today. Uh, we're really glad to contribute to the, the ecosystem of knowledge, which is the R community. Um, uh, hopefully this is helpful for you. I, I, we had to do a lot of research when we were trying to implement this themselves. As we mentioned, we're, we'll do a technical write-up as well to get into some of the nitty gritty of what makes this work versus not make it work. Uh, but Rachel, turn it back to you if we have any time for Q&A, if there's any questions. Yeah, there are a lot of great questions here, but just wanna say thank you so much, Tom and Bijan for an awesome presentation. It, it's great to see APIs and, and microservices in action. Um, I always say we're all clapping. You can't hear us. If we were all in the same room, we'd be clapping for you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go over to Slido. And just a reminder, if you want to ask questions, um, you can use the Slido link and you can put your name in and I could call on you or you could just ask anonymously too. Um, but one of the questions was, can you use an R Shiny front end together with a microservice back end? I, yeah, I can take that if you want, Tom. Um, yes, the answer is yes. So you could use any any front end uh, technology. Shiny is is a perfectly fine um, front end technology as well. Um, it, you would simply just be making the same calls um, that you know a Python script or React app, app would do. Awesome, thank you. Um, I see Rahul asked a question on Slido, and Rahul, feel free to jump in if you want to add any other context to I'll allow let me let me fix some of our settings here um, but it was do you hire separately for back-end data science development and front-end shiny UI development we do uh, so we have a dedicated front-end development team now so as the team grew we separated the responsibilities of the data scientists who originally did some pieces of front-end development uh, we separated that out so now there's a specialized front-end development team that front end development team both consists of 
uh, uh, React-focused developers, uh, but also uh, UI UX designers. So there's an entire suite of design tools that are used to mock up of how an application should look like, which is fantastic because instead of having to program something to show a user, you can show them wireframes or, or pretty pretty advanced mockups, and those can be immediately exported into a structure of a web page, which allows the React folks to just start populating everything. So they don't have to take that sketch and then kind of say, what color did you use? All that kind of automatically imports into the HTML CSS that allows them to be able to do our work. And our data scientists focus right now on two things. One is API and backend development, and then also data science. So they still have some development components uh, that they do, but they're programming in R uh, and, and soon now Python. We've been focusing on R, we're gonna be doing more Python coming up, uh, allow them to create those APIs, but also do the pure data science work as well. So we have now separated those responsibilities. When we began, we were a team of five, Individuals were now 45 individuals. And so as our portfolio has gotten very large, Coda and, and, and two dozen other applications, uh, that has allowed us to separate those, uh, those functions. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, so there's a lot of great questions here. Um, excuse me if I missed this, but are all microservices managed by a centralized unit? Um, so they don't have to be. Um, one of the big benefits of microservices is that, is that you can launch them um, in any service that makes the most sense. So um, right now we do a lot uh, on RStudio Connect um, because it does a fantastic job of not only hosting, but load balancing too. Um, that's a big reason why we were, we were able to move so quickly. Um, but you're able to use you know, Azure functions um, and again, uh, any sort of you know, third party um, services as well. So, if there is a service that um, you, you know your firm decides to that is, is more beneficial to purchase and it's you know cheap enough, you can also in integrate that into the same suite uh, of microservices that you're doing, and you save yourself the headache of, of developing it. So they don't have to be on the same uh, com compute node; um, they can be sp as spread out as as it as it makes sense. Awesome, thank you. I'm just firing these questions away at you right now. Thank you. Um, someone else asked, who can access our Studio Connect in your organization? So we, um, right now we protect it by a two-factor uh, environment uh, in the Azure cloud. Um, so only KPMG um, practitioners can access it. Um, eventually we're looking at uh, getting to the point of, of, of managed service or something like that. Um, but it's right now KPMG employees. Uh, let's see, another question was, how difficult or easy is the testing given the very nature of microservices? So for example, with the distributed environment. Hmm. Um, relatively easy. So um, in the distributed environment, um, there's still a URL that uh, is assigned to each one of your service. Um, all you have to do is know that URL and what, um, if, it's any, if it's like a RESTful API. So you would need to know that URL um, and the, the verb that you would use, so a get request or a put request. Um, Postman does a pretty fantastic job of letting you uh, kind of set those those tests and also create a collection and share that with the rest of your team too. Um, but you just need to know those two pieces of information and then uh, from the user perspective, uh, you don't need to know where it is. Um, it just, it's there. Um, so relatively relatively straightforward. Cool, thank you. David, I see you just put a question into the chat and, um, but when you decided to go the microservice route, what was your first step in building that architecture? So I think Bijan, you and I flew down to Austin and we got into uh, a whiteboarding session together, talk about what, uh, what is the approach? How, how, how do we implement the uh, microservices within our application architecture? How does it overlap with our code and version control management and our continuous integration, continuous deployment? And what did that look like as, as a portfolio? So the first bit was is understanding where our challenges were. Uh, we, in the application development is we're working in this case of Coda, we're trying to do a lot more noticing that there was a lot more bugs that were happening, development timelines were harder to plan for, and just you could 
as, as somebody who's programmed myself in my history, you could tell it was just, it was getting very difficult for the team to navigate forward, even though the team was entirely dedicated to the project. So understanding where those challenges were really allowed us to have a very productive conversation about how to implement microservices in a way that was designed to benefit the team and not just to do something a, a little bit different. From there, in terms of implementing the microservices themselves, Bijan, and, and this is where you touched on in, in, uh, in your area about uh, 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 domain driven design on this of then designing those microservices within the application that that makes sense. What becomes interesting, and now we are starting to tap within our team, is within within a given application, there's domains that you can think about how it works in the application. But now we have several related applications that might reuse some of the microservices that were originally built in other applications. So there's this sort of meta domain that we're now considering of this application does something interesting or something that we want to consume from how did that interlap with this application that sits over there. So now we're having that, that conversation of, of design around the entire portfolio. Hopefully that uh, helped answer the question. Okay. Um, I had a question I wanted to ask the team because I heard you were hiring and I'm just curious to know a little bit more about what roles you're hiring for. So as I mentioned, we're, we're growing large. We're at 45 individuals now uh, across the four different countries, uh, pre predominantly in the United States. And right now we're hiring for a machine learning engineer. So we're looking for somebody who actually has a good understanding of the technology, for instance, of what we talked about today and how to implement that uh, and how to continue to implement this technology across the team. And also somebody with the mathematical optimization knowledge and background as our team does a lot of mathematical optimization projects. And by joining this team, what you tend to work on both is the analytical problem set, such as how do I optimize routes or paths, but then try to figure out, well, how did I turn that into a data and analytics product and technology? So we take those case problems and we turn that into applications and solutions. And we like to use the word solutions because we do develop web applications, but sometimes our solutions are APIs, libraries, and other ways for them to be able to consume information. So uh, that's our current posting that we have now. Uh, we can share that uh, probably in a chat window or some way. Uh, but it's a machine learning engineer with KPMG. And we're always, we always will have new positions that will be opening up in the near future. So do keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Yeah, feel free to share the link in the chat window there too. I'll do that, Bijan. Okay. Yeah. Bijan, I, I see um, Abdul Aziz, and apologies if I mispronounced your name, asked a question in Slido that said, may you suggest some web service servers that host R-based services or Python? I would suggest our Studio Connect. Um, that's uh, it. Took a lot of the um, understanding of the infrastructure away from our team. Uh, we didn't need to know. Uh, we didn't need to set up load bound. Load balancing alone was was a big concern of ours when we started this, um, because if you're requesting and in, in, to an API and you have other users requesting to that same API, you don't want that one. It's a single threaded process, so. You don't want that one thing to be blocking the other users. Um, our Studio Connect does a fantastic job of this. Um, we've scaled it up to 100 concurrent users and not run into an issue. Um, so right now we're, we're uh, on a, uh, a virtual machine running our Studio Connect, and I don't see that going away. I think that's a great way to get started because it um, it takes a lot of the need to understand the infrastructure side away from you. You, you publish and you're in a great position. awesome and i did not set up that question or pay you to say that <laughs> that's great that. <laughs> awesome um one other question was are applications built with microservices as responsive as those that adopt a monolithic architecture or do microservices in introduce a lag so a very good question uh, that one of the benefits of hosting it within the RCU Connect environment is that there's little latency between those two because the APIs in the front end are sitting in the same physical location. You could have latency introduced if you were to have servers sitting over here that were hosting APIs and then a front end that was sitting somewhere else because you then have to rely on the slowest part of an application, which is, which is the network or the internet trying to communicate uh, across all of that. So right now, yes, absolutely. It's, it's just as responsive, if not more so, because we're not taking one set of code, R, 
then using that to write a different language, usually JavaScript, that is then trying to process through the browser or the interpreter, which that was introducing a lot of latency of, is, is it the code? Is it something else? Is it the server? Is it the browser? I can't tell, me how, can't tell you how many times we had questions trying to figure out. It's like, when it was just all monolithic, like, okay, what's causing, what's causing the latency issues? Here, it's just been a, a lot cleaner. So there's not a lot of latency because they're, they're, the, those two bits are sitting right next to each other. And then all the bits of code are doing exactly what they're supposed to and not trying to do seven, seven different things at the same time. So it's been a lot better. Cool, thank you. Um, the question was, can you show the backend response data through developer tools? Yeah, um, let me see. Um, Okay, so this is the, um, I just uh, made the request to, to generate this chart um, behind the screen here. Um, but this is, uh, this is the, the exact response uh, of the data. So we have, um, in, in my case, I just have the, uh, the manager ID and um, their designation. Um, and then uh, uh, it, it's just a, a simple array of, of all manager IDs uh, and designations underneath it. Um, you know, not nothing, nothing too uh, dramatic. Um, and we can take a look at this one as well. So, um, these are this is the metadata um, that would actually pop up uh, on a different, um, a different area. And then uh, we go here. We have org statistics and our organization. So, um, this uh, this is the data that's populating um, the kind of cards that I like. If I hover over it, um, there's information here. Um, so that information is all enca encapsulated in these these JSON JSON structures. Um, so a couple of requests were made um, behind the scenes. Um, backends for front ends is is two of those three requests, um, and then this one is for the radio the chart that we're looking at um, there. I hope that answers the question. Or if there was a follow up, I'm happy to speak to that. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see one last question on Slido. And Rahul asked, can you speak more about the logging microservice? Did you build it ground up? Did you adopt an off the shelf package or app? We use two services really. Um, one of them uh, is used for our infrastructure monitoring um, and network monitoring. So that, that is an off the shelf um, service. Um, but for our applications, because we're, we're building these completely from scratch, we uh, use our own um, service. Um, and it's a relatively simple um, activity-based uh, logging where, you know, if, if an error happens, we log that error. If a warning happens, we log the warning. If it's just a simple request, it's an information uh, log. Um, so to answer your question, both, um, but yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom and Bijan, for the awesome presentation. That was great. And appreciate all the awesome questions as well. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.